Okay. So, uh, okay. Take it away. Let's see. Done. Okay, done. Thank, Thank you, you people. Okay. <laughs> well, I sent to Sean the PDFs for a uh, summer, uh, some, well, the excerpts from Love and Opus book, How to Face Death Without Fear, because it seems like wisdom has run out of paperbacks. But you can get the digital version if you like, and I really do recommend it's a handbook. But I've excerpted a bunch of chapters, but I hope. Sean isn't so sick that he might get up and forward it to the website or something. I don't know, or put it on, put it on uh, the Zoom for the people here. I'll remind him if he doesn't do it by tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, I think the last teaching I gave here was on the same topic. So we're back to death again. You know what to do. So we just start with our little prayer. It's got two parts, and the first part is for any of us who feel we're already kind of identified as Buddhists, so it's taking refuge, reminding ourselves of our reliance on the Buddha, his teachings, and the Sangha, the first two lines of his prayer, which we'll say in Tibetan. And then the second two lines are really expressing, the Tibetans would say, setting your motivation. We don't talk like that. We'd say, what's your purpose? What's your goal? Why are you here? Why are we together? It's a very direct way of putting it. What's our goal? Why are we here together? Well, it's to listen, presumably, listen to these teachings, discuss them, analyze them, think about them. And if we choose to, internalize them, you know, because it's all advice. <clears throat> it's given as advice, you, but you decide if you take it. And it's advice, I mean, broadly, it's from the Buddhist perspective of how to develop our own amazing potential so we can be a benefit to others. But here specifically, it's related to, well, it's really related to the way to live your life, you know, so you can die well taking this Buddhist perspective, you know, and of course, how to help others. I mean, the advice is really to, it's, it's how to help others, because you need to be able to help others. If you're dying in bed, you can't pick up a book and say, what will I do now? You need, to be, you need to be helped to do it, isn't it? But it's kind of implied that the advice is for oneself, you know, how to help us die without fear. So how to help others. And I'll sing the prayer in Tibetan. Sangi chodang toke chong nam la jang chu badu dagni kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonan ki jola penchir sangi drupa shog sangi chodang toke chong nam la jang chu badu dagni kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonan ki jola penchir sangi drupa shog Sangye chadang soke chong nam la jang chu badu jang ni kyap su chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki dro la pen chi sangye dro pa shok. Okay. So this this book of Rinpoche's, which I happen to edit, which is why I'm familiar with it, and inspired by the advice in it. Um, it started years ago when it, it's the, the source of it, the main source of it is a teaching that Rinpoche gave back in, in France like 20 years ago and um, he was talking about another topic altogether and one of his oldest students came to him and said, oh, my daddy died recently, he was like 97, you know, and she said, I didn't know what to do. So Rinpoche was quite shocked because she's been a Buddhist for years and, you know, we all know if you've heard any Buddhist teachings, I mean, you just you get death confronted with it from day one, Buddha goes on about impermanence, you know and learning to, to see the reality that life changes, things change, and the way we suffer when things change. So, of course, the most radical change we're going to have <clears throat> is called death. And because Buddhism is so, you know, has got a very clear view about what happens at death, then it's kind of a major part of the Buddhist teaching, and most people were very familiar with it. But I think because of the intensity of our aversion to death, because our intensity of the grasping at oneself as permanent, even though we know it's intellectually ridiculous, we're not permanent. But the fear of death is so tremendous. The fear of not being me, you know, is so strong. I think we, we, even though we hear the teachings, we don't listen properly. We don't really, it's hard to hear it, you know. So Rinpoche was quite surprised. So he, he shifted tack in those teachings and then started teaching the, the, the bulk of the content of this book, you know, how to prepare for death, how to help others prepare for death, prepare for death. So, okay, why would you do that? Why would you want to prepare for death? So it depends on your viewpoint, doesn't it? I mean, if you're a Christian or a Muslim, you definitely want to prepare to death because it's your stepping stone to get to be with God, isn't it? It's a very important stage, a very important stepping stone. If, you're, if, you, if you've got philosophical materialism as your view, 
then there's no reason to prepare for death, except, you know, there's no reason. Why would you? You're going to fall into a black hole. How do you prepare for that, you know? We don't like to think about it. And that's a very, and that's, I think that prevails in our culture, you know. <clears throat> this, um, yeah, and even, and yeah, yeah, to, to prepare to death, what for? I mean, why would you do that? The preparation we would think about, you know, is to prepare from the point of view of a will and what coffin we want and this, you know, the prayers, the prayers we want to have done at our funeral, let's say, even though you mightn't be Christian or anything. That's the best we can do with it, you know. But to prepare experientially, emotionally, to go through the process and be ready for death, there's actually no reason to. There's no reason because if you if you if you're going to disappear, if what is you is totally finished once you stop breathing, which of course is the materialist view, and it's just one of the many views in the world that exist, isn't it? You know, it's fine. Then there's no real reason why would you prepare for it? How silly! And this is, I think, the basis of why there's such a strong emphasis these days and it's growing continuously <clears throat> on this business of um, permission to kill yourself, you know, isn't it? Because if, if life gets too tough. And it makes sense. I mean, if, if, if Buddha's wrong, if the Christians are wrong, if the Muslims are wrong, I mean, I don't know what the, I mean, there's views all over the world. I'm not even what the Abor Australian Aboriginals think. There's such, such abstract views that they sat there for 20, 45,000 years in that piece of Austra piece of country called Australia now before the white people came along and took it. Lord knows their views. They're so complex, I don't understand. Everybody on the planet, we can see that. Humans have all come up with viewpoints about reality, isn't it? And materialism is one of those. But because that view prevails and is so much in our faces, you know, um, then we think, well, if life is that bad, we, ha we should have the right, we have the permission, the right, to kill ourselves. And indeed, we do have the right. I mean, from the from the Buddhist perspective, of course, we have the right. You have the right to do anything because you're in charge of your life. But interestingly, His Holiness one time, he said, and it was it was in relation to abortion, because it's a very emotional topic, isn't it? He said, of course, you have the right. But he said, like anything, any action you do, you should know the consequences of it before you do it. And that's reasonable. I mean, if you don't know the consequences of running across a freeway with six lanes of traffic going 100 miles an hour, but you're a bit foolish. So it's just, it's, if you, we all have rights, but that comes along with responsibility and a sense of, of the consequences of an action. That's just an intelligent way to see it, and we understand that. So, of course, your response, your approach to death very much depends upon your view of what will happen afterwards, isn't it? So here, of course, we're taking the Buddhist view. And particularly, I mean, Buddhism, Buddha, Buddha, you know, Buddha had the view, this Buddha, in all the teachings in Buddhism all over the world, in the different countries, in Burma and Thailand, you know, it's all essentially the same source coming back from the Buddha. And where did Buddha come from? He came from these genius Indians, you know, these genius Hindus. I mean, I don't know the right words, but, and as Dalai Lama says, and I like to quote, were these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who, who came up with, who began the investigation into the nature of self. So this is a totally part of their investigation. And, of course, these Hindus, they have the view of reincarnation and karma because, I mean, Buddha went as far as he could go in that system and then diverged in his own direction, specifically in relation to his own experiential findings about the nature of self, who we are, what we are, how we come into this life, how we live it, and, you know, the purpose of it, and, how, and what happens when we leave it. So this whole idea of, of so-called reincarnation, this is very, is, is, it's been around in Asia for several thousand years, you know, it's nothing special, it's just that we've never heard of it in our culture. So that means if we want to hear about and think about this, we need to understand the Buddhist view of what it is that reincarnates, what it is, and that's the mind. That's called the mind in Buddhism. Buddha doesn't have, Buddhism has no, alternative to a thing called a spirit or a soul. And that's a major distinction. That's where he diverged in relation to that point. Hindus call it an Atman, an innate self. Christians call it a soul. I think probably the Jews and Muslims do as well, I'm not sure. I know the Greeks talk about some kind of essence. So there's always this, and I don't know what the materialists would call it, I don't know what, if we have a view at all what we are, who we are, what is an I, what is a person, you know. So Buddha is very clear about his view. And, and before we go further, I always like to talk about this. I always need to say it. It's so important. Because we come from, most of us, 
unless we've come from a Buddhist culture, most of us have come from a, a culture where the religious philosophies posit a creator. And if you posit a creator, then by definition, he's usually called he, we know that, by definition, he is superior and he runs the world, created it, created me, made the rules and is the boss, speaking simply. So it's necessarily, you can't possibly, um, so then you have to have faith in that person because you can't prove that God is right. If you can prove that God is right, then you become God and that's just not appropriate. So that, of course, there's a massive view within the creative religions of having faith, of believing in the, and I'm not criticizing that view. I promise I'm not. Because you can't prove it. How can you prove God is right? If you, if you can prove God is right, then you know it to be the truth, which means you've become God and you can't say that. So that's very strongly the, the view we've got about religion. So then we hear Buddha come along and he sounds a bit like Jesus. He's got a list of 10 don'ts, just like Jesus. You know, it sounds very similar in many ways. And then you hear about karma and you hear about, you know, different realms of existence and you hear about reincarnation. It's a variation on the theme, basically. I mean, Christians are talking about reincarnation, except you've got two options, heaven and hell, isn't it? They don't talk about coming from another realm. They talk about coming from God. So there's very, sim very similarities, but many fundamental differences. So the, the, then the point is, and what I'm getting at here, this is crucial. It has to underpin all the teachings we listen to if we're interested in Buddha, his views, you know. Where do these views come from? I always quote this, but this is years ago in New Zealand. Nelson, New Zealand. Actually, one lama, Kirti Sentai Rameshay, did he ever come here? I think he did, didn't he? You people don't know. We well, yeah, some here in the 90s, no. This lama, Kirti Sentai Rameshay, just by the way, because it happened to be this place called Nelson in the North Islands, two little islands, New Zealand. Very tiny, five million people. And this lama was asked, where's the best place on the planet to meditate? And he said, Nelson, New Zealand. I'm just mentioning that. It was interesting. I don't know why, but he did. Anyway, this, there's a talk at Nelson, and I was giving it, and there was a fellow in the audience, and he happened to be a scientist, and he asked this question, and I've never had anybody before or since ask this question. He said, who revealed the teachings to the Buddha? Which, if you're a Christian or a Muslim, is a totally appropriate question because it comes from on high. Totally appropriate. And, but it's not the Buddha's view because he's not a creator. So then it's really important to hear this. We've got to think this through. This is very shocking to us. We have to think this point through. If he's not a creator, then you have to ask the question, where did this information come from? It was not revel in, you know, it's not revelation. Buddha didn't sit there and have a dream or a, or a vision. He didn't make it up. He's not speculating. And I said to the guy, I answered, and I said, well, would you ask Einstein who revealed the teachings about relativity to him. And of course, he laughed, everyone laughed. And of course, we don't, because we know that when Einstein is talking, anybody who's called a scientist, or even for that matter, a good cook, if you come up here and start giving recipes, we have to deduce that you didn't make them up, you didn't steal them from your mother, you didn't have a vision. Do you understand my point? It wasn't revelation from this high sky, it was your experience. That's Buddha. So, uh, so there's certain, you know, so then, and this is a shock to us. We have to think it through, but this is the meaning. It's the implication of he doesn't posit a creator. Then where does it all come from? Because we assume it comes from on high. We assume you can't prove it. And then, of course, because it's religious philosophy, we assume you can make up your own because you don't have to prove it, which is extremely irresponsible, you know. So this came, this information, every word in this room that you're hearing, and you should check up because I might be a maniac making it all up. Get a check, you know, that is coming from this person called Buddha, channeled, I mean, over the centuries, coming from him, and then through the centuries of all the people, the yogis and the great practitioners who who verified and practiced and 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 experienced what the Buddha put there, you know, like Einstein. You know, you don't just believe Einstein on the first day. If you hear about E equals MC squared, you can't just believe him. You've got to start with one plus one. And you go each step of the way. And then as the Dalai Lama says, if you do that with Buddhism, you take Buddha's methodology, you like what you're hearing, you take it on board, and then you tick the boxes as you go. You don't just swallow it whole and say, I believe in it. We tend to, which is this intellectual laziness. 
We take it as a working hypothesis, it's very logical. And then at a certain point, you can prove the Buddha's wrong. Of course, you must reject him, which is exactly the same you do with Einstein. It's that approach. And that's surprising to us to hear that that's religious philosophy. That is the Buddhist approach. Because you've got nowhere else to go with it. <clears throat> if he's not a creator, if it's not from revelation, then it's either made up or it's come from someone's experience. There's no, there's no, or he's stolen it, you know? So it's a really important point to think about. Because it, it informs the way you use Buddhism in your life if you want to be a Buddhist student, because of course it's your decision. So there's different ways that Buddhism is taught over the centuries. You listen to a Japanese, you know, Zen teacher, you'll hear very different things. You hear the Thai teachers, the Burmese teachers. There's different traditions, different ways of approaching, different and there's but this is so this is coming from the Tibetan tradition. And, and, and this is, it tracks itself back to all the great Indian, to especially to the Nalanda monastery. As Dalai Lama always says, we are, we are the Nalanda tradition. There's this amazing institution, extraordinary university, this place, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century in India, North India, near Rajgir. Astonishing place of learning, famous, you know, in Buddhist history. And all the stripes of Buddhism were, were practiced and studied there. So then that was carried in the minds of the holy being straight to Tibet in about the seventh century. So there's different tracks of Buddhism, different levels of Buddhist teachings. You've got the teachings you're going to hear in Burma and Thailand. You've got the teachings you're going to hear in China, China and Taiwan. And then you have the, that, and that's all the, the regular teachings, the general teachings, both the teachings of the renunciation path and the bodhisattva teachings. And then you've got the esoteric teachings, the Buddhist Vajrayana, and they're really only extant among the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So, just saying all this, okay. So a lot of the information here that we're going to go into, the death process itself, and many of the practices are coming from the Vajrayana, all of which is informed by the basic teachings. You know, they're not separate, you know. So there's enormous emphasis in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition um, about death, the process of death, and of course how to utilize, how to, um, uh, how to, at the technical level, how to become familiar with this process, and then how to become truly able to be ready for the time of death, in order to take the opportunity of going through the mind to a very subtle level, which we're going to talk about, so that you can become enlightened at that point. There's a very specific te technology about death, you know. We'll, we'll try and cover that in these five days. <coughs> so, okay, if we want to know um, this idea of death, the, the Buddhist approach to death, we've got to know what it means by the mind. Because what continues after death is the mind. So this is kind of important to just remember. There's various points about the mind that are fundamentally different from the views we hold in the modern philosophical, the materialist view, and from the Christian view as well, or the Jewish one, the, the Muslim one. So if, you know, like I said, if we're Christian or Muslim, then our source is the is this creator. When your mummy and daddy, you know, hop into bed, egg and sperm come together, or wherever they hop, egg and sperm come together, then God puts a soul there. I've heard that the Jews say God doesn't put the soul there for a few months. Which is why for Jews it's okay to have an abortion before that point because the soul is not there. The materialists just say the egg and sperm come together, and that's it, that's you. The Buddhists would say egg and sperm come together, and that's the moment when consciousness coming from before, your continuity of mental moments coming from before enters into that egg and sperm. That's the moment of conception. I always mention um, many women have the experience of knowing that second, knowing that they've been, oh, oh my God, I'm pregnant, you know, that second. I always quote my own experience. I was 23. I remember I had an abortion. I remember that, I'm trying to be too personal here, just saying, that second, I not then, the abortion time, but the time of the other business, I knew I was pregnant. I knew crystal clear. I, I didn't know the words, oh, well, consciousness has just come into my womb or my fallopian tube, wherever it was, but I abs with absolute clarity, I knew that I was pregnant, you know. I mean, one of my friends, her daughter and the daughter's husband were staying with them while they were building their new house. And the daughter came down for breakfast one morning and said, oh, mummy, I'm pregnant. And the mother said, oh, good, when did you find out? 40 minutes ago. 
So it's a very common experience. Women have had that experience of the time when you're in with you're in the bed with a boy. Do you understand? You know that second. That's where consciousness enters. That's the Buddha's view. And so that's the point. Buddhism would it's like a complete and that would be the what the soul is, I suppose. They think God puts the soul there. But the Buddha, there's no concept of a creator, there's no separate component called soul. There is your mind. But the point is, your mind, and these are the fundamental points, your mind is by necessarily not physical. It is not a function, it's not even not the brain, it's not even a function of the brain. Actually, while I was editing this book, I always quote this too. I was reading this wonderfully hilarious fellow called his book called The Undead. It's not about zombies. Nick Teresi. Dick Teresi. You read it. It's yes. fascinating, isn't it? Yes, yes. He's an American journalist, medical journalist, and he's done all this research. His his expertise is death. And he did all this research um, of all the problems and obstacles and difficulties in the medical profession now as a result of the business of taking organs. Oh. And so now there's so, so much contradiction and confusion, certainly in the States, he was talking about that was his area of expertise. It's really now people aren't at all, at all clear when death really does occur, which is brilliant that people are questioning their assumptions, you know. I mean, the Dalai Lama spent, he spent a lot of time with many uh, uh, scientists because, you know, um, experimenting on the brains of of dead yogis. As the yogi dies, they go through this meditation. The Buddhist view is their mind stays there after they breathe. We're going to go into all this. And they put these, you know, got these machines that put on to try to detect um, an indication of, of a subtle consciousness. I remember one journalist reading, I mean, or for example, in this book, he's talking about all the, you know, the, the stories about people coming back to life. I mean, this is all over the world. In every culture, there are, there are reports of people, quote unquote, coming back to life. Of course, it's too, you put it in the too hard basket because you, you don't know how to handle it. Because, you know, we, we just convince the brain is that's all there is. So I remember in this book, one doctor in this business was quoted as saying, I can now say with certainty that consciousness is not a function of the brain. He had a whole, this boy, this man, this Dick Teresi, Dick Teresi, Dick Teresi, isn't it? Had a whole chapter on people who have what's called out of body experiences particularly on the operating table, you know. There's one woman, because I mean, many people quote and talk, tell, say later, they, they knew what the doctors said, they heard, the, they knew, and they sort of, there's a lot of cynicism about it, you don't believe it, you know. But he quoted this one woman who had to have such a radical procedure that from the, the materialist point of view, the medical point of view, she could not possibly be conscious. But she, he said, he joked, he, she reported the most vivid, out of body experience that you just can't argue with, you know, you can't argue with it. Or even when you're in a coma, it's not possible from our perspective, Western perspective, to, to be conscious. But I always quote the example of a woman I know in Australia who was in the deepest of deep comas. They didn't think she'd come out again. And she knew these different lamas. So I, I asked some disciples of these two lamas to please pray for Judy. So I went in there, husband let me go in there every evening and I would just whisper prayers in her ear and every now and again I'd say, Judy, Song Tsar Ken Se Rinpoche is praying for you, Judy, he's holding the suck your chins and is praying for you. So anyway, she came, after a week she came out of this coma and she said that the only thing she could remember from all those weeks, she was this husky voice, she didn't know it was me it seems, she thought it was a blue lady coming through the window saying exactly those words. Now, I can tell you, I told nobody. And the nurses, when I came into the ER, the nurses were worried because they knew I was a Buddhist nun. They said, please don't ring any bells. So I had to be extra quiet, you know. <laughs> so I whispered prayers. Nobody knew. So you, you, you can't argue with experiences like that. You can't argue with them, you know. So anyway, it's bringing doubt, which is fantastic. So anyway, let's just say that one. Oh yeah, this woman, that's right. The one, there's a story, this woman, one woman, another woman who was on the operating table. So as you know, when you take the organs, you, the moment they stop breathing, you keep them, you, you put whatever you put on them to keep them breathing, isn't it? The heart beating and the breath coming and all the body warm and toasty, isn't it? So this is the crucial point. We're going to go into this more detail later. From the Buddhist perspective, consciousness is still there, but at a subtler level, we'll go into this. But this particular woman, she he quoted, the author quoted this 
experience, this woman on the operating table, there she is being kept breathing. From the Buddhist perspective, her subtle consciousness is still there. Her sensory consciousness has ceased. You know, she can't breathe on her own. Her body, her, you know, she wouldn't be working on her own. She has to have the machine. But her subtle mind is still there. I'm going to this. So she, the nurse who was monitoring, there she's on the operating table, and the nurse who's monitoring her heartbeat said the moment they got the circular saw to cut her open, the heart went from 100 to 200 beats a minute. And the author joked, well, what's a dead person got to be anxious about, you know? So from the Buddhist perspective, this would be an I would my own um, interpretation of that is exactly the same as if you're in the coma or on the operating table having an operation. Your grosser level of consciousness is completely ceased because you're under anesthetic, so you can't see or hear or feel, but your subtle consciousness is vividly aware and you have this experience of floating above your body. This woman, you could deduce, was having exactly the same experience. So she's not dead. Her subtle mind is there. She's vividly seeing what's going on. And she has a panic attack because she's realizing she's not dead yet. And then they're going to cut her open with a circular saw. I mean, my goodness, I wonder how it went to 100 beats a minute, you know, 200 beats a minute. So it's also, interesting. anyway, this is all interesting. It's all part of the discussion we're going to have. So the Buddha's view, the mind by definition is not physical. It's not even a function of the brain. But of course, you have a brain. So it doesn't mean you don't have a relationship with the brain. In fact, without I always say, without insulting neuroscientists, you could say that at least at the grosser level, because Buddhism talks about gross consciousness, subtle consciousness, very subtle consciousness. Buddhism would assert much subtler levels of mind consciousness than we do in the modern world. So at the grosser level, for sure, the brain plays an intimate role, but the brain isn't itself the mind. So the way to say it, without insulting neuroscientists, is that what goes on in the brain would be a physical indicator of what is going on in the mind. That's the best way to say it. So mind is not physical. Mind has much subtler levels of experience or cognition that we do not posit in the modern world. And this is coming from these Indians well before the Buddha. They're the ones, these genius Indians, who invented this technique, this meditation technique, this brilliant psychological skill called um, shamatha, single-pointed concentration, uh, calm abiding, a level of subtle concentration. They, they're the ones who invented this. Buddha took it with him when he diverged in his own direction. So it's been around for 3,000 plus years, this brilliant technique that's still living, existing, being practiced every day right now, available to anybody that enables you to completely subdue the grosser level of mind, sensory and the conceptual, and to get to these subtler levels. I mean, that just sounds abstract to us because we don't posit some of the same levels, you know. So the mind is not physical, has much subtler level of cognition. And the thing that's a shock to us is because if you're a materialist, you know, your mother and father make you, give you a mind, you know, don't they? Your anger, your love, your compassion, your kindness, you've been good at musical football, they come from mummy and daddy, and you track them back to grandpa, grandma, and back to the monkeys. That's the materialist model. The Christian one and the others, God puts a soul there. So your source is God. That's clear, isn't it? Now, I don't know what the Australian Aboriginals say. I don't know what the local people on this country said that before the white people came along. All these different views in the world, aren't there? about, you know, origin stories of human beings and so on. So the Buddha's view is, as I said before, and when I was there, I was in the, with this boy when I was this hippie in London in 1967, 68, you know, and uh, I knew, I said, I said to myself, I knew I was pregnant, you know, that second, this boy, I remember that, vivid, vivid. So that second, consciousness from before, We'll go into karma in more detail later, why they came to my womb in particular. This person, I always think of it as a her, came to my egg and sperm, you know, that second, from before. So the idea here is that, so it's not the handiwork of mummy and daddy, and it's not the handiwork of a creator. In fact, the more you study the Buddhist teachings, the more you, if you, if you choose to, take them on board, internalize them, learn them, practice them. The, the idea that you can get a mind, get love and compassion and kindness or psychosis for that matter from another person is a very wacky idea. 
the Buddha view is in your consciousness, mind is super personal, super individual, super personal. It's yours. It is not possible for a person to give you anger, give you insanity, or give you a tendency to be good at music. My mother, for example, was a musician. So why was she good at music? Which brings the business of karma, which we're going to go into. Why did my mother why did, was my mother was good at music? Because she had brought it from her own tendency from before, just like being good at anger or good at football. It comes with your mind. You come fully programmed at the first second of conception with your own tendencies. So then she saw her little Bobsy, me, and, and noticed that I had a tendency to be good at music. So, of course, the world would say, oh, Rabina got her music from her mother. No, Rabina was good at music too because she must have practiced it before. And then most conveniently, I get born to a good musician. And my mother can then help me nourish my music. This is the crucial point. And this is absolutely fundamental from the Buddhist perspective and from the point of view of practice. When it comes to your anger, your fears, your love, your compassion, your generosity, your depression, you know, we have a powerful tendency, which is reinforced by the materialist model with respect to us, that my anger, my jealousy, my this and that come from out there. Not only my mother, but from the boyfriend and everybody else in the whole world. And I'm this innocent victim who didn't ask to get born, who got plonked on this planet, and it's not my fault. So the Buddhist idea of continuity of consciousness and karma is fundamentally different and it brings an incredible shift in your mind if you really practice that, you know. You take responsibility, you own your own self, you own your own mind, you own your own tendencies. So your mind's not physical, has much subtle levels, is not the handiwork of mummy, daddy or a creator and can't come from nothing. That's the, the dumbest idea you've ever heard as well. Nothing comes from nothing. And this is, a, this is so when Lama Sopa first started teaching Western people, all the hippies in the 70s, you know, who all came along with the view of the mind being the brain and so on and so forth. So clearly if you hear about reincarnation, you know, you know, you know you, you're kind of in trouble if you think your brain goes somewhere, except into dust, it doesn't. It goes into dust, it goes into dirt, it doesn't do it. So his, Lama Sopa would always teach first about mind what it is, its character, and the crucial point is there's this approach they call to learn to understand the beginningless nature of mind. This is the, wack this is the wackiest thing we've ever heard. We have this deep impulse to believe, to, to feel as a truth that there has to be a first moment, there has to be a first cause. So Christians for sure call that God, and it's a serious philosophical point with them to prove that you can have such a thing as a first cause. Muslims the same, Jews the same. Buddhists are absolutely, that's a point at which he diverged from the Indian, Indians, you know, because they have a similar view. By definition, from the Buddhist perspective, everything is cause and effect, so by definition you can't have a first cause. Because, I mean, it's like those smarty pants kids. Miss, who caused God? You know, you're told to be quiet, you know. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a completely valid question. So the mind then, you know, um, is just kind of, I use this, analysis, this, this idea of it. It's a they have a term in Buddhist psychology called mental continuum. So one approach to the mind is to think of it as this kind of mental continuum or like a river of mental moments or like a, like a series of chains of moments, a link, links in a chain, this moment of my consciousness. And there's a meditation you can do to get a sense of this. Rinpoche would do this. <clears throat> this moment of my cognition, my mind, my cognition. And what's its main source is the very millisecond before of that of that cognition. And what where did that come from? And it's seamless. It's, it's not you can't have a gap in your mind. You can't have a gap where for five seconds your mind didn't exist, then pops up again. It's got it's a continuity of mental moments. And actually Buddhism talks about the physical world being exactly the same. If you started analyze, you know, started analyzing this particular thing here. And you break it down and go back, and that came from this, which came from that, which came from this, which came from that. You inexorably will get back to the first second of the universe. You couldn't, there's nowhere else to go. So, of course, the question is, what caused that? And Dalai Lama, with all these scientists, what, just paraphrasing, he said, Big Bang? No problem. Just not the first Big Bang, that's all. So from the Buddhist perspective, both mind and matter, the way they talk, the universe consists of minds and matter. That's it. And they still talk 
in terms of the four ele four elements. This is very old fashioned, isn't it? And we don't talk, we talk about 42 million elements in science, don't we? But still in the Buddhist view, and they're similar to the Chinese system, the Ayurvedic system, the four elements. So the matter consists of the four elements and minds, and that's it, that's the universe. And that you can't you can't ever get back to a first moment, which instinctively kind of is outrageous to us, because we instinctively want and believe. There has to be a first moment. Where did I begin? Where did it begin? Where did that begin? Where did the universe begin? We want to find the beginning. So for Christians, it's God. Not complaining. Not viable for the Buddha. So then to get to this idea, that still even as I say it, your mind's beginningless. So what's the implication of this? I mean, even to think you got one previous life or one future life sounds like ridiculous to us. It just sounds like a joke. It's just hilarious to us, you know. From the Buddhist perspective, consciousness, you can't find, you get back to the first second of conception. Because if you go back in an unbroken chain of mental moments in a meditation or even in your own memories, you could when eventually, you get back to the first second of conception. Well, we know the second before, egg was in mummy's body, sperm was in daddy's body. And where was your consciousness? Came from a previous second of that continuity of mental moments. Of course, at a subtler level, a few weeks before that was in a previous body. It's all laid out in depth and extensively in the Buddhist literature. So it's a very different view, you have to admit. Extremely different view. But the idea that our mind and matter and universes therefore and experiences are beginningless, this is too much. This is too much altogether. And but I mean it's why are we so shocked by it? Why because only because we have strong assumptions that it can't be right. But we have no proof. We have no it's just instinctive. The very and Buddha would say is this view of having a first cause or no somehow it got to start somewhere is coming is one of the mistakes our mind makes this desperate clinging to things and having no cause I and mean, it's quite subtle you know it's very fascinating so if this came okay this is the answer this is the point if this information came from the Buddha then we have to deduce that he could this is his experience. I mean, if you read a cookbook and, you, and it's by Fred Smith, either Fred stole his mum's recipes or he, he has the experience of cooking those cakes. So you can say that his experience, that's where those recipes came from. Okay, he can thank his mum. Any experience like that is like that. You know, Einstein will not just, he's telling you his experience. So Buddha's the same. So we have to deduce... Because that's the biggest shock to us. Well, how can you prove reincarnation? Don't be ridiculous, we say. Because we have these assumptions about mind and its capability informed by the materialist view. So anyway, it's all up to us how we think about this. So in your mind, not physical, much more subtle levels, beginningless, and indeed, endless. It sounds a bit depressing. Because we just want to die and all disappear, don't we? We'll go to sleep and make it all go away, you know, when things are depressing. Consciousness is a beginningless and endless continuity of mental moments. And so it happens to be, the Buddhist view is, and this is the Buddhist path, is the potential of this mind. I mean, what's the point, you know? Not just, you know, walking on a treadmill. What's the point of all this business? Because the Buddha has found from his own experience, this is the Mahayana point of view in the Buddhist view, that our every mind, by definition, is a potential Buddha. So Buddha, very simply, the etymology of that word, I mean, it's very simple. Buddha implies the eradication of all the neuroses and ego and misery and depression and rubbish. And Da implies the development to perfection of all goodness. So speaking simply, this is Buddha's experiential, own, own direct experience. He's shown that, he and he says, here's my methodology, this is what I've achieved, over to you. So this is the, the point of being a Buddhist, is you're aiming, you're moving towards this natural potential. And so that's all in, in, that needs to be, so your approach to death is informed by all this. You know. So we just started, so any questions? It's going to be covered in the five, we've got five whole days, so plenty of time to talk about everything. But are there any questions about what I've discussed so far? I can't see you people close. I've got a, the camera so far away, I have to squint at you all. I'm so sorry. Maybe I'll bring my computer and I can. Yes, go, go, go. Yes. So um, um, that's a lot to try and comprehend. So 
I guess what you're saying is that we established and figured out that there was a concept of beginningless time. All this is coming from Buddha's experience. That's the way to put it. Yeah, that's right. So, um, and he, I guess, also figured out that everybody, when you were born, you instantly uh, were born with all of this personality inside yeah. and that was all. You brought it with you. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly right. It's like that. So Go I guess the my thought with that is that it's almost incomprehensible. How could anybody figure that out? Like, I understand. <laughs> that's a good point. I mean, it's such a good point. I know. What's your name? Dave. 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 Yeah. It's such a simple, direct, clear point. I mean, let me just tell you what you'd be like. This is Buddha's view. Well, okay, this is okay. The key to this, this is this from coming from the Indians, which does not exist in our modern modern philosophical views of the mind or neuroscience, is this investigate these techniques that they invented, these genius Indians, three thousand years ago plus. As the Dalai Lama says, they're the ones who began the investigation to the nature of self. So the central technique that they cultivated, which is the which is the the tool that they use that that enables us to have this level of knowledge, meaning about the mind of the past, is this single point. They call it single point of concentration. So it's a technique that even if you you know if you're really qualified in this life, you you'd be off into the mountains for a couple of years. You'd be able to get it. It's there. The technique is there. The instructions are there. It's a living technique. It's a bit hard to get it because you've got to give up sex drive and rock and roll and lots of other qualifications to be ready to do it, which is pretty intensive. But this technique enables you to completely subdue the grosser level, sensory and conceptual level of your own mind, which is all we live at, to access these much subtler level of mind. So if we were to read some of the experience, what the mind is like at that level, it is to us like science fiction, because it's not existing in our modern culture. Do you understand? It's not, and it's very precise and detailed. So the mind, the mind, and this is the level of being, not physical. Once you subdue the grosser levels, your consciousness is completely crystal clear. You can infinitely see the past, the future, the minds of others. It's as if your mind is vast. I mean, you, you have to just hear the words, which completely sounds mystical to us. But this is coming directly from the experience of these dudes before the Buddha. So that's something that does not exist even with respect in the Christian culture. There are amazing yogis and saints, but it tends to be a bit mystified and, you, and there's no technique to get like that. Do you understand my point? But it's all there in the literature. It's all there. It's all there in the literature. This is the human capability. So it's kind of a level of capability. We think in the West, you know, to be very intelligent and to know science and to become a genius musician. Of course, brilliant, but this is a billion times more powerful and more extraordinary. But it's not just here it is and cross your fingers and maybe you do it if you're lucky. It's techniques of how to do it. It's all there in the methodology. Do you understand, Dave? Yeah, and an enormous amount of perseverance. And... Oh, uh, you say all the right words. It's very really fascinating. <laughs> exactly right. Total. Honey child, I tell you, you've got to be enormously enthusiastic and enormously hardworking and very kind of organized and very, very developed and very ethical and extraordinary person to even want to get this. And this single point of concentration is just the beginning. Okay. But but it's there. It's in the literature. That's all I can say. Do you understand, Dave? I think I understand. So for me, um, the thing that would keep you possibly able to have that kind of perseverance is that along the way you see improvements. In your I life. mean, you, you, he's been. I mean, you, every word you say is perfect. You, you're like a little Buddhist. You just you've done this before, Dave. There's no doubt. Every word you say is is, is somehow is perfect. It's correct. You're exactly right. And, and that's where that's where it's quite a struggle. Forget about whether we get single point of concentration. That the basic level of work, daily practice of being a Buddhist, is to know your mind intimately. Not forget about single point of concentration, but have a real awareness of the workings of your own thoughts and feelings and emotions, ever more subtly every day. And then to realize that we're not set in stone, and that we can change the mind. This is its nature. And the, and then and you see progress and this is a this is a really fundamental. Otherwise, you wouldn't persevere with anything if you didn't see the, the progress. And that's often very hard for us because the irony of ego is we're kind of addicted to the misery. I'm hopeless. I'm no good. I can't do it. I'm so, I mean, we really love thinking rubbish thoughts about ourselves. I joke and I say, but I've never met a person who says I can't stop thinking good thoughts. <laughs> we love thinking bad thoughts and, and always about ourselves. You understand? It's a very strong tendency. 
So to have this positive mind, an optimistic, enthusiastic, wow, pretty intense. Yeah, I've never even thought of that in a mindset that I can't stop thinking good thoughts. What, say that again, Dave? I've never had that thought. They are mean neither, baby, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a really good point. Thank you, Dave. What else, people? Talk to me. On, on Zoom? I was going to say on television. Yeah. On Zoom, any questions? Nothing? Okay, I'm here if you have a question. Okay. I see Andrew's hand. Oh, oh, oh I, have a, I have a question. Just hey. So, um, oh, can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm retaking uh, the Discovering Buddhism Module 5 on death, and there's something like that interests me about it. It's like uh, Dr. E. Bush keeps talking about de de degenerating times. And my question is sometimes when I think about, like, oh, we're in a degenerating time or something that can lead me to this like sense of uh can i help the world or can i help myself or a sense of defeatism and then so my question is like are we living like according what is a buddhist to do like in terms of a degen the degenerate time and like think about shanti deva's fourth chapter on joyous perseverance like I think like the more I'm like, oh, we live in this time, the more I like give into that thinking, the more the defeatism builds as opposed to the joyous effort, which is like no matter what time I live in, I have the precious human rebirth and should be just grateful. Like I feel like that's why I struggle is with the self-doubt of kind of the darkness of the world and wanting to not give into self-pity, but take the responsibility to um, take the responsibility to live with courage rather to, than to live in doubt and fear. I understand, Andrew, very, very well. Thank you, sweetheart. Let's talk about it, okay? Thank you, sweetheart. Very good point. It means, to answer your question, that means we have to sort of uh, look at the contents of our mind why we struggle to be optimistic, why we struggle to persevere, why we get depressed easily and get give up easily and think I'm hopeless easily, as you said, degenerate times, you know, why that is. Well, it's in one sense, Andrew, the answer is so simple, it's embarrassing. If you were playing the piano and you were really good at it, are you listening to me? Andrew, you're there, focusing. Well. Yeah, sorry, no, my play games because I take certain medications, but I'm. But you're listening, darling, are you? Okay, good. So if I could see that you play the piano very well, and then I say to you, "Wow, Andrew, why are you good at piano?" What would be your simple, simple, simple answer? That I take joyous effort and put in the time every day, that I practice it with... Uh, Stop, right there, right there. you practiced, you practiced. So if I say to you, God, Andrew, I'm always so angry, and, or you say to me, oh, Rabin, I'm always so depressed, I'm always so angry, and you say to me, why am I like this? I, I'll say to you, you must have practiced it. So in other words, if we look into our mind very simply, whether you've got a tendency to be good at football or music, or depression or anger is because the tent that we must have practiced that more than the other things is in one sense that's it but I think with ego we somehow over exaggerate the badness and we think it's like some big lump of concrete inside us and we don't think we can change it and what happens is it looms large in our mind and we think this is who I am we tend to identify with it. This is the tragedy, Andrew. And that's why every day it's so important. That's why for me, I like to study the Buddha's teachings and listen to the teachings on how mind is not concrete, how mind can be changed, how nothing is set in stone. And to even read some of the experiences of the great yogis about their experiences of joy and happiness. These are the, fr these are the proof of the pudding. So it's good to be inspired. We need to be inspired, Andrew. So then you can get some confidence 
And that's why we need good teachers. I mean, you know, if you look at the Dalai Lama, he's a really good proof of the pudding. He's a perfect example. There he is after 70 years nonstop trying to make Tibet a, you know, a free country. He never gives up. He's always optimistic. We go, wow, I'd like to be like that. I'll do what he does. So we need examples, which we then use to help us go, it's okay, I can manage. I can do it. But it's a struggle because the negative tendencies seem to be very strong. And then the tragedy is we exaggerate them. We make them, we make, like our mothers would tell us, we make a mountain out of a molehill. So we've got to look at this and be very clear with ourselves. And then we've got, and the most simple answer, because the negative thoughts seem to come more easily, we have to, we tend to think, well, I've got to wait for some good thoughts to come. No, don't wait. Decide to have positive thoughts. This sounds very hilarious to us. You know, we don't need to invite the negative thoughts. We don't need to invite the self-doubt or the depression thoughts. But we have to bring in positively, say, optimistic, positive, reasonable words, especially about ourselves, which encourages us to keep moving. It's really, really powerful part of our practice, Andrew. Do you understand? Are we communicating? Yes. Um, if I was to try to summarize, like, for example, if I practice negative thoughts, like, oh, the world is going to crap, or oh, yada, 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 what I'm practicing is giving into a mindset of victimhood and defeatism, whereas if I'm practicing okay, no matter what's going on in the world, I have the strength to persevere. I can, like, like I can have the patience, like my patience is right before the uh, chapter on joyous effort. I have the patience to be like, there's darkness in this world, but I can be a light within and give it out. Exactly right, Andrew. You're exactly right. But it takes hard work. But again, you think about this, Andrew. If you were trying to be a good musician, look at the hard work. They spend eight, ten hours every day, year after year. So they have incredible perseverance. And they're the people who become successful. So we need to cultivate this perseverance based upon the logic that it's possible. Do you understand me? I do. Why is it so intense in front of you? You know, it's so interesting when in, in the, you know, he's talking about this in the Shatty Davis teaching, in the perfection of the body's upper part. The key one, they say, without which you can't succeed, that we take this to ordinary life teaching, it's called enthusiasm. So it seems a bit ridiculous. Well, how are you supposed to get enthusiasm? It's like a shout and laugh or something. It seems so silly to get enthusiasm or perseverance, they say. And it's really logical. All the lovers say, and it's really true. You will not persevere with something unless you know the clear benefit of it. If you didn't know the benefit, you give up. You just have to know the benefit. But even then, we can, but even then, you know, you think the, the benefits of going to the gym are very evident. You see all the people who are looking at with their lovely muscle tone, and you go, oh my God, I love you. We still give up. You know why? Because the major, the major obstacle to this enthusiasm, this is very shocking. The major obstacle to enthusiasm is called laziness. Yes, yeah, so if you can't pray, you've got to recognize The first one is so obvious, it's a joke. It's like, I can't be bothered. 
So then you've got to analyze what is it you can't control the decision and it's what it takes just what. So the real main enemy is this primordial, and this is a simple attack. It's not an attack to the sex or anything. It's an attack to the cup. We are we crave to give you that cup. Mental and physical. This is a skewed drive. So we all know, it, and let's talk about the gym. You know you've got to go to the gym. You get there, you get on your machine. And we all know that the second it starts to become difficult, that's the point at which you have to keep going. But if we're, but we, we eat, oh, I've done my, I've done this and this. But we haven't really. So in other words, we can't stand feeling uncomfortable. Attachment are crazy. So as soon as you've got to stretch yourself, but and by definition, making effort is what you have to do. You have to make effort to do the thing that attachment doesn't want. And the only way you're going to do what attachment doesn't want is to know the benefits of doing it. Then you're prepared to go through that, that point where you go beyond your comfort zone. And that's the attack. That weird attack. You know? And that's just the first one. I'm Now the second one, which is more tricky, Sounds like a virtue. It's oh, I'm too busy. I'll do it. And this is the worst crime against ourselves. The lovers all say the worst, the way, the saddest way to die is with all the un, all the things you wanted to do but never did. Don't say. I remember. Yeah, that one. And that's really powerful. I'm too busy, and we all know later we'll have. I do. We say, well, I'll do it later. We feel virtuous. But we know lazy never comes. When lazy does come, you know, it's extra hard to do it. You build up this habit to not do it. And then when you try to do it, you have a burden. So it's, it's such double trouble putting things off. And that's the key to success. People don't put things off. They're the ones who achieve everything. So and the reason you put something off is it's unpleasant. It's the same thing. It's attachment to comfort. It's huge. We crave it. The third one sounds a bit abstract, but it's the deepest of all and the worst. I'm not capable. I can't do it. And that's why we feel low. Nah, not possible. I couldn't get sick of one concentration. I can't go to the gym. I can't become my center. I mean, they're just all the You've got to have incredible, but we're all self belief to know that you can do this and to persevere through all the struggle. And it's very sincere, but the majority of people in the world don't have this. And then the sadness that we don't achieve it, and then we get depressed, and then we get jealous of the people who did achieve it. But this is the one, and we can all see to achieve anything, we've got to have this. And of course, we've got to taste it. And that means we've got to have confidence. We say in the West, practice makes perfect. But the Tibetans have a wonderful way to say it. They say, nothing ever gets more difficult. That's the way to put it. It's more gentle, isn't it? Nothing ever gets more difficult. We just have to remember. But, you know, we've we got to remember and just. And then we beat ourselves up with junk, guilty, and all this sticks and rubbish. And then, even when we make a little bit of effort, the trouble is, because we're so self kind of putting down, you know, you, 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 you say you're studying music and you pass your grade one, you persevere, you got to grade one. And then we go, oh, wow, great, I'm a grade one. And then you go, oh, I'm only in grade one. Maybe I'll be happy when I'm in grade two. And you get to grade nine, but you still get seven. You're still miserable. But you, you've got to be happy we've got to grade two. Delight in it. Rejoice in it. Pat ourselves on the back and then have enthusiasm to go to grade two if you enjoy the process. Also, as well, not just waiting. And this is really just strong practice we have to have to say the positive thoughts to ourselves, to rejoice in our qualities, to rejoice. To, and I said, as I said to Andrew, just study and read. That's why Lama Yeshi was always so amazing. He'd always talk about the experience of yogis to give yourself courage. Wow, you mean I can be like that? He tried to get us to see that we can not. Excuse us. Venerable. Excuse us. So the other thing is, too, we have to remember. A sign of success can be that you think you're getting worse. Like you go to the gym, you don't come home looking divine after one day. You come home with muscles you didn't know you had. But you know it's a sign. That is Venerable? Yes. Hi. 
The Zoomies are having trouble hearing you. You're going in and out. Maybe because you were over here. Looking over that way. Where's the mic? That, that this is the mic. Yeah. But this is the mic. Well, that's that's. Oh, the that's the amplifier. Read. Oh, I've got to sort of that's talk in here. Is it? Is read. that better? That's beautiful. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've got to carry it with me. I'll do like this. Thank you. All right, and I'll move all. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. All right, people, what else? Questions? As long as that's not guess, but it's all part of the deal. Oh, I'm going to bring in first. Maria has something to say? Maria, you got your hand up, baby. Talk to me. Maria, where are you? Come oh, on. that was it. That was my comment, too. I was trying to get, get your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Thank you. All right, we know. <laughs> what else, darlings? So, okay, let's continue on this business of the mind. They must carry on death and the mind and everything. So, okay, so the, so what drives, so why is it then, okay, so what is it that drives a Buddhist, to take the say, Tibetan Buddhist path, to want to know about death and to want to know how to die well? What's the reason for it? Because, I mean, in the West we talk a lot, and this is wonderful in the West, there's so much talk these days, people electing to work in the hospice movement, doctors, I went to one conference in Australia where the doctor, young doctors and nurses choosing to work in this area now, helping people die peacefully, helping the families deal with death. It's wonderful. You know, it's really nice. I went to this one conference. It was so moving in this children's hospital in Sydney, and, like, the thing that is unbearable to most people is the death of babies and children, right? And so because of all the fear and the stress, you know, all the culture of it is keeping it hidden and there's fear and there's depression. And it was this lovely, kind doctor who was trying to make it all open. And I remember at the at, he had a, the morgue he had, the little dead babies, you know, was, was decorated like a nursery and it was open. And the children would come in there, come and meet my dead brother, making it open, you know, which is already fantastic, breaking down the fear of death and all the drama that comes. So that's marvellous. But, of course, the extra component for the Buddhists is to prepare your mind for the, for the future. So this is the fundamental point in Buddhism about being a work in progress. And if we take this view, then we've got this extraordinary potential to be perfected, quite literally. The Buddhas, I mean, the massive teachings on the mind in Buddhism is extensive in the literature about how we've got the negative, neurotic, ego-based, eye-based, fear-based, unhappy states of mind we're talking about them, attachment, anger, depression, you know, we all know them. Then we have the positive ones, love, compassion, kindness, generosity. We all know we've got all of these, but my sense is in our materialist model of the mind and the materialist view of a person, we give equal status to all of these, don't we? And we assume that a normal person has a little bit of all of them, hopefully more of the good than the bad, we all know that. But there's no view, this is very simple, there's no view in modern psychology that would suggest that you can rid your mind utterly, eventually, of all the rubbish. That's extreme, you know, that's too bizarre for our, our world. And that you can perfect the virtues to literally perfect them. That's the meaning of the word Buddha, like I said. So that's pretty abstract for us. So we, we need to have, if we're liking the Buddha's teachings, it really does demand that you do study this model of the mind. And it's dealt with an incredible depth in the literature. It's huge in Buddhism, coming from India, you know, coming from these Indians. What the mind is in its nature, understanding these states of mind, just learning, and crucially, if it's true that you can rid the mind of the neuroses and grow to perfection the goodness, it's evident, if that's the end result, that the, that the, the, that the process is the, is the distinguishing between them. And this is where the Buddhist psychological model is so incredibly direct, you know. We know ourselves in our materialist model that posits mummy, daddy and the brain and all the nervous system and all the physical part as being a major component. And then psychologically, we look back to the past to find out why I'm this way, why I'm that way, what the Catholic nuns did to me, what daddy did to me, because we see these as a major cause. I'm not criticising. Buddha doesn't argue they're not causes, but his main point is, and this is the shock, is that what goes on in the mind is the main cause. 
And this is where the view of karma comes in, which is dealt with extensively as well. You know, but everything we think and do and say, everything we think and do and say programs our mind. And that everything we think and do and say is, our, is this is the main source of who we become. So in a sense, it's like His Holiness the Dalai Lama said one time that karma is like self-creation. It's a very different and very powerful view. So the whole job of being a Buddhist then is to learn these techniques that enable you to know, to train yourself, to hear all your thoughts and feelings and emotions at a much subtler level, and then to unpack and unravel them, and not just to say, oh, this is who I am, but to identify the neuroses and distinguish them from the virtues and literally be a cognitive behavioral therapist. Change your conceptual stories. Change your mind. It's a very practical thing. It's not mystical. So, you know, for this, for this perspective, from this perspective, it's not relevant that your mother hit you or your father loved you. It's nice to know that because they can help you see how you responded when you were little. But the mind is the main point for the Buddhist one. So it's incredibly direct. When you study Buddhist psychology, there is zero discussion about physical and about the, 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 the environment and about people. It's totally to do with the nature of the thoughts and feelings themselves. This is extremely unusual and it's extremely direct and you become intimately familiar with the workings of your own thoughts and then you can con reconfigure them. This is what being a Buddhist is. Then if you deal with your mind every day, you don't have such a thing as trauma. Most of us are carrying around burdens and burdens of undealt with garbage. No wonder we live in fear and panic, you know, called, called PS, PTSD and all that business, because we haven't dealt with stuff. But if you're really working on your mind, you get rid of that. There's nothing you now are afraid of. You can see the things and then you let it go by working on your mind, on your own attitude and approach to things, you know. That's what being a Buddhist means day to day. Being your own therapist, as long as you said. So the Buddhist view is this is all part of the process, and it gets to ever more sophisticated levels. Well, you you know, and of course this goes on from life to life. It's just the Buddhist view that your mind continues, and you bring with you, and you want to bring with you the main things. We've got millions of past lives. The Buddha says we've got millions of tendons, seeds in our, okay, the karmic idea is that your Buddha uses seeds and fruits, the concept of seeds and fruits, that every millisecond or whatever we think and do and say leaves seeds in the mind, programs us, that produces our own future. This is the main source of who we become. So we've done millions of negative things during the universe, and we don't want those to ripen. So we, do, we have lots of practices where we train with discipline, practice our body, train our body, speech, and mind to do positive things, to refrain from negative. We, we have lots of practices we call purification. So that when you, and the time of death does come, you're ready for death because you know all about impermanence and you, many of the practices about how to get ready for death, we're going to go into this, are how you live your life so that you're ready for death and you've programmed your mind in virtue and goodness. So then death is easy peasy. You know, you can go to the next life and carry on without missing too much. That's the plan sort of thing. It's a long-term view, you know. I didn't ring my clock, so I don't know what the time is. Okay. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, there it is. Look, I can see it. I can see it here. Venerable Rubina, I have oh. a question. Yes, sweetheart. Hi. Talk to me, Sarah. Sorry. I'm a very um, loud speaker here. I'm so sorry. Go on. Um, can you give examples of what, um, like when when we're able to access more subtle levels of our mind, can you give examples of what that experience might be like? I, I um, meaning, like on the on this one level, on this one level of mind, and then you know, when you practice meditation and we practice, practice, practice every day, practice, um, and I just wonder, like when do we know that we're accessing more subtle states of our mind? I mean, it's not mysterious. You're only going to start to get access to more subtle levels of your mind when you've got single point of concentration, sweetheart. Okay, got it. It's very clear. 
And that's yeah. a whole different kettle of fish. Got it. And that's very intensive, full-on, disciplined, day-after-day practice. It can't just be a few times. You've got to, go, you know, to be, I mean, even just, I remember read. I remember, that's when you really make radical shift. But every, it doesn't mean we don't work every day. And it doesn't mean we don't get more and more familiar. Even at a conceptual level, we live at the level of chatting. Even if you've got a mind that's uncontrolled, we all have, uncontrolled, right? Chatting, chatting, chatting. Still, we can become so much more familiar with it than we would have once. And we can learn to be more courageous and deal with it and not be panic stricken by it and work with it every day. And it becomes very natural. Well, that's definitely becoming more subtle. Whereas once we wouldn't even have known what we were thinking. Do you understand? So we, yeah. all, we, can, make, we can make a lot of progress, darling. Yeah. But to really make the radical shift, it means you need to have some level of single point of concentration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where basically, I mean, it's described in terms of nine stages of cultivation. And I remember, I remember interviewing one of our monks, Venable René, a, a Swiss Swiss monk who's been a professional meditator for like 30, 40, 45 years, you know. And I interviewed him back in the 90s about him, one of his first main single-pointed concentration meditation retreats that he did at a Saling, our centre in Spain, up in the mountains, you know. And he maybe, he said, in the first few months of the two and a half years, he, he, he got to about the the fifth of the nine stages. So at that level, already the concentration is incredible, which means which means you've, you're super clear and you've subdued the gross conceptuality to a radical degree. And then because you're, the, and the sensory has become more subtle as well. In other words, you've learned to access this subtler level of your own mental consciousness beyond the sensory and beyond the grosser conceptuality, which is the best we can do is just be cosmic about it because we can't understand that. I mean, some people sometimes have experiences about tasting their, their own mind and feel like they've got enlightened, have incredible visions and clear and blissful. This can happen, but you can't sustain it. And you, it doesn't last because you don't know how to do it again, you know. You've done this is really trained. And the, and also the, because when the mind is more subdued, and this is one of the major things in the Buddhist teachings about the mind, that when your mind is more subdued, your mind is very joyful, just naturally. So he said, there's no question the level of joy his mind experienced was so superior to any joy he'd ever experienced through his senses. So this is hard for us to imagine because we live at the level of sensory. We, we define our entire life in terms of happiness and suffering practically in terms of sensory, you know. So it's a whole nother kettle of fish. But there's matters we can do till we get there, I promise. And that just means the sign of success is you're catching your mind, you're owning responsibility for it, you, you're more stable, you're less up and down, you're less neurotic, you're less guilty, you're less angry, you're less jealous, you're more stable, you're more kind, you're more clear, you're more you're more authentic. That's the sign of success, sweetheart, and be happy with that. Yeah. Thank you. Understand? Yeah. Okay. Good. I have a question. Yes. Um so when you were talking about kind of the Christian um, idea or uh, idea of like heaven and hell, and I grew up in I grew up in a Chinese culture. It's very it's also very Buddhist, and I also we there are many people in my life who believe in reincarnation. Yes, and they but what they're hoping for is to not be re born in the hell realm. No, I understand. Or to be born in a better realm. No, exactly. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, Tava's pure land or something. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Okay. So in that sense, you can say that you know my upbringing is a Catholic. There are many similarities, except of course the difference is that. From my perspective, as a Catholic, I, my source was God. And then if I was, you know, led a good ethical life and devoted myself to God, when I died, I would be with God in heaven. That's basically the two options, heaven and hell, isn't it? Well, Buddha would assert, as you know from being a Buddhist, Buddhism, we're going to go into this in more detail now, of course, over the period, over about five days. But, the, but there's a whole, Buddha's got this whole, and this comes from these Indians as well, this vast view of all of the universes that exist. There's a whole elaborate worldview, you know. And so they're all in terms of, so if you, okay, there's different levels of these realms of existence, realms of existence. And the Indians were the ones who first posited all this, you know, from their own inner experience. So they're all 
so the, the, we're in one kind of real, uh, series of existence, series of realms of existence called the desire realm, where attachment prevails. Attachment, it, it, these these re, these different rebirths, there's six of them, and they're all on a spectrum from enormous joy to intense suffering. And they're all basically they're all created by the sentient beings themselves. We're not sent there by God. That's a major beta point, of course. There's, they're all literally experiences that each individual being literally creates from themselves. We are all the creators of our own experience. So the spectrum of possibilities, the, the, the two first two are called the God realms, which is equivalent when you read the Christian and the Muslim teachings, they're the same experience, which makes me think that humans all over the world in different cultures have come up with similar findings, you know, in terms of spiritual philosophies, differences as well. So the God realms, a couple of those, and the experience of those, they are they are the literally, it's the Buddhist perspective, they are the fruit of virtue. In other words, virtue, goodness, compassion, kindness, general, if you live your life with goodness and compassion and kindness, not even a spiritual practice, but just being a good person, it results in that type of rebirth. It literally, your mind goes to that type of rebirth. And this is where, from the Vajrayana perspective, this more esoteric teachings in Buddhism, where we talk about the physical body. The physical body, and this is where acupuncture and the Chinese, the Indian system, Ayurvedic one, and the Tibetan medical system come in. We've got the body and the mind. We've got gross consciousness. Okay, I'm going to say all this first. Go back a bit. We've got gross gross consciousness, which is our sensory, and then that's inextricably linked, isn't it, to this gross body. Then we have more subtle consciousness, which is our mental states. We can experience them in this body, but they're more they're more subtle. And then when they're related inextricably to this subtle physical energy, they talk about the subtle bodies. 72,000 subtle channels and coursing through those channels are all these different wind energies or prana. I mean, the Chinese call them meridians. What do they call them? You know, that type of chi and that kind of business. And then that's very linked to the mind. The states of mind and the wind energies are super, super integrated. So whatever your mind does, if it's like angry and negative, it pollutes the wind energies, and then that programs the mind to be more negative. It pollutes the wind energies, which in turn karmically creates suffering in the future, suffering bodies and suffering external existences. So virtue purifies the mind, purifies the wind energies, and then creates the cause to have these type of rebirth that's called a God realm that's literally created by your own mind. This human birth is created by our mind. And so you experience incredible joy, incredible bliss, and it lasts a long time. So Christians say that's the end result. For the Buddha, it's not the end result. It'll run out. You haven't rid yourself of all the ego yet, so you fall back into the suffering realms. Then you've got the human realm, which is said to be one of the good ones as well. But clearly, our, our bodies aren't made of light, are they? You know, it's obvious. And then you've got the suffering realms, which is the animals. Then you've got even more suffering, the spirits like hungry ghosts, all kinds of ghost-type beings. And then you've got the hell realms. So there's a spectrum of bliss, realms of happiness as a result of virtue, and then the, the three and then the three suffering lower realms, they call them. All of these are the possibilities from the Buddhist perspective, the Buddhist experience. And they're all created by those sentient beings. So hell realm is this experience created by those beings. As I mean, as she said, they're not they're not sort of the devil is some being called the devil isn't sitting there saying I'm waiting for Lama Yeshi to come along you know that they are the experience of the of the the result of the negative energy of those suffering sentient beings so it's quite as it's quite subtle that to think that whatever we see and experience is the fruit of our past actions we program our minds and so we have experiences that are a result of that, you know. So virtue and goodness produces happiness, clarity, kindness, and reasonable karmic appearances. Such negativity, ego and negativity, produce intense suffering. So this is the law of karma as far as Buddha is concerned. It's not run by anybody. It's not judgment. It's not punishment. It's not reward. It's a natural law. So from this perspective, Buddhists, the Buddhists say well, we create our own realities, life after life after life after life. Okay, something like that. Summary. We'll go into more details. So because and this is what informs, certainly, the, I mean, the Buddhist view, you don't, you know, because you get a strong sense that you want happiness, you want to be clear, you want to be content, you want to be fulfilled. And at the simplest level, forget about Buddha, you don't want future suffering. And this is what drives one at the very first level. 
a sense of self-respect and self-compassion to only want good future results. I mean, we get this when it comes to health. We know very well if we go to the gym every day and eat good food and don't smoke cigarettes, we'll have a nice healthy body. We get that. We understand it's up to us to do it. What Buddha says mentally it's the same because we produce our own lives, our own reality. That's a pretty intense view. It's not punishment. It's not reward. There's no punisher. There's no rewarder. It's superstition for the Buddha. So that's what drive, very first drives our wish to be, want to be happy, to want to have good results. Nothing wrong with that. We just get so guilty about it. And then on top of that, we then have compassion. And when we've really begun to get some level of clarity and happiness, we can then want to benefit others as well. Because we're all in the same boat, you know. Boat needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So this is, what, this is what's underpinning the, the daily practice of a Buddhist and living a life in this way, living accord, and then, and then informing all of that with this extra energy of realizing impermanence. That we, one of our major sufferings in the delusion, the deluded part of our mind, is we be, because we're so attached to happiness and attached to nice things, we can't bear the thought that nice things will change into unnice things. We can't bear the thought that our husband could die. We can't bear the thought I might get sick. And we can't bear the thought that good things change. It's too unbearable. So what happens when good things happen, we grasp at it tremendously because we can't bear the thought that we won't have it. So we cling tremendously. So we live in this, then we add on to it, this fantasy. We say, now I found happiness. Finally, I found it. Like as if you set it in stone and it's going to last forever. It's completely fantasy. Nothing lasts forever. Everything in its nature. And there's extensive teachings in Buddhism about impermanence. The things in their nature are going from changing second by second, millisecond by millisecond. So getting in our daily lives, getting in touch with the reality of impermanence, already makes you more content and fulfilled. And then you start to become familiar with the impermanence of death. And you, you accept that it's normal. You accept its reality. You break down all the fears of it. And that causes you to want to live your life well and to be prepared for death when it comes. And if you prepare yourself like that and live a good life and ethics and program your mind with goodness, death is easy. Death is a fine experience. You'll die with a happy mind, you know. And then, of course, we're going to discuss more the death process itself and how that's very much a part of the more esoteric practices, but they're very powerful. It can really help us at a more dramatic level to make shifts in our practice. We'll go into that. We'll discuss that. I know we're supposed to hear me for two hours. But this way, uh, talking fast can be an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I always say this, and I'm embarrassed to keep repeating it, but it's true. 40, 30 years ago in Queensland, our centre there invited a bunch of us nuns, we lived 100 miles up the road, to come down and give talks on Tuesday night or something. I always tell people this story. I've told this story 100 times. So they went, three nuns did. We gave a 90-minute talk each, the three Wednesdays. And then Miffy it transcribed them. And the other two nuns were eight pages and mine were 24. <laughs> so it's about 11.30 at night already, okay? So I think we can finish early. Yep. All right? Yep. And it's intense. I mean, I'm intense. I can't help it. <laughs> One woman just emailed me and said her husband laughs when she listens to me. She said, how can you listen to that angry woman all the time? <laughs> I, can't I can't believe how people can listen to me on YouTube. I can't believe it. I think well, people are insane. How can they put up with this loud, screaming voice the whole time? <laughs> people, I don't know. It surprises me. So, okay, I'll stop shouting now. I'll see you tomorrow. And think about these things. I, I hope Sean gets the message and sends you the PDFs, okay? Because there's excerpts from Lama Zopa's book plus some other teachings in there about karma and things like that. So I hope you get them and you can study them in between, okay? And this is the way we can put them on the computer for people to get them. They have to go into Zoom to get them, don't they? We put them in the chat box. What can we do? Like, I can put the link. If I have the link, I can put it in the chat. Can't we put the two PDFs in it? We have to put a link to the PDFs. The link. Where will the PDFs be, though? Check. Now you put a PDF right in. You do it right in the link. You can put it in the chat. You can. You put the PDF in the chat. So that means you've got to go into Zoom to do it. Can they get into Zoom easily? Do you have to pay money? Do you know? Huh? Does nobody know? 
But you're doing it all. You're the expert. Someone could do the link and, and email and text it to somebody. Too. Okay, forget that. I'm just going to get Sean. He must have a mailing list of all you people. Well, the problem is we don't have the emails of the people who are attending this event. What's the calendar? Oh, okay. So what do you mean a link? But where is it? What does the link lead to? Should we all type our email addresses into the chat so that someone can get them? If you put the PDF in a URL, it'll just like populate. Someone's going to put it on the URL. Yeah, Sean, for somebody. That's the so back to square one. I'm just emailed Sean. So we'll hope you'll do it. Okay, I'll remind him. Okay. Okay, people. Thank you, darlings. Goodbye, and I'll see somebody tomorrow all being well if you don't die beforehand. <laughs> okay. So hang on. Thank you, darling. See you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Thank you Bye, for your question. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Oh,